danger, survival, love. This is the epic tale of one man's attempt to build a shed, punch a wolf in the face, and then kiss a stranger for an achievement. While also finding time to ride a donkey and discover the worst riding animation this side of Barbie Race and Ride, this is the tale of my adventure in Worm Online. If you've ever wondered what a massive fantasy sandbox MMO created by Notch, the guy behind Minecraft, would look like, look no further. This is it. And my god, is it complicated. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, I'm Josh Strife Hayes and this is Worst MMO Ever, a series where I play every MMO I can in a journey to find the worst. Drop a like on the video or sub to the channel for more MMO stuff, ring the bell for all the future notifications. As usual, a massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch. More info on this at the end. For now, let's begin. Today we are playing Worm Online, the self-proclaimed ultimate sandbox MMO, and indeed one of the earliest sandbox games releasing all the way back in 2006. It has stood the test of time and is now available on Steam. So let's give it a go. It's only a 2 gig download, so don't be expecting 4K textures or complex storylines. The game starts immediately and wow, okay, I'm already feeling very early 2000s freeware garish texture packs. You start in first person. To zoom out, you must hold left click while scrolling the mouse wheel backwards. And this is the first example of something being more complex than it needs to be. Nice simple tutorial, WASD movement, no jumping and no running. You'll always move at maximum speed for the terrain you are on. Now there's no character creation, but we are told we have a magical golden mirror in our inventory and we can use that to change our appearance, but only once. The inventory itself is a nice simple list layout with all items having quality, damage taken and weight easily displayed. When walking up a steep hill, you need to press Z to switch to climb mode. Then in climb mode you'll move slower but make it up slopes and this is a perfect example of the inner complexity of Worm Online. Playing this game feels more like running a complex machine and less like exploring an adventure game. It's all about switching things on and off, modes, activating items at the right moment and this overly complex design is at odds with the no fail state paradox of complexity which I'll expand on later. Ultimately, you can do a lot in Worm Online, but you need to make sure every single dial is reading the correct thing before you do it. In our inventory, we have a shovel. Activate it by double clicking on it. You can have one object activated at any time and your context when interacting with the game will change based on whatever you've got active. When it's the shovel, you can dig. You'll see the game world is divided into tiles highlighted as you cursor over them. Worm Online prides itself as being a do-anything game and that includes terraforming the land. You can dig holes or tunnels, even entire mine shafts, and then dump the dirt that you've dug elsewhere. Now it takes an absolute age to do, and the change is very small, but you can do it. To chop a tree, you don't just click on the tree. That'd be too simple. You need to deactivate your shovel, activate your hatchet, then right click on the tile the tree is on, and then click chop. And you'll see the action timer to the bottom right. Sometimes one action isn't enough to get the result and you won't automatically repeat actions. You need to manually click to do it again. Worm Online is really, really into the whole make the player repeat actions for the sake of repeating actions school of design. After about a minute, the tree is felled. So we now take the log and you move super slowly. Your movement speed is based on how much you are carrying and what surface you're walking on. You can run on paths or going downhill, but once on grass or going uphill, you forget how you your legs work and slow to a gentle stroll. I go to drop something on the ground and get a warning box and now the first lazy bit of design. Text overflowing the box boundaries. Come on designers. Complex systems may make your game feel bloated but it's still high quality. But bad visual design? Bad layout? That makes it look amateur. Can you steal this sign? No. Well there go my dreams of being a sign hoarding baron. And now the combat tutorial. Behold, as I can't find anyone. What? This is the right place. Big sign, combat, sparring grounds, weapon on the floor. There's no one here. Is it lunchtime? Is the combat instructor on break? You know what? I'll skip the combat tutorial. I've played an MMO or two before. I'm sure I can figure it out. How complex can combat really be? Two hours later. What the hell? Why is combat so complicated? What is this thing? What do the buttons mean? Why did I skip the tutorial? 
Okay, we seem to be at the end of the intro section. That wasn't a bad little tutorial. It's given me the basics. Is there anything I've missed? Oh, fishing. Okay. Are you going to let me fish? No, you're going to give me a massive text dump. Right. It's almost like you started designing an interactive tutorial to let the player actually experience the systems they'd need to know. Then you realised your game was quite complicated, and a tutorial might be quite long, so you gave up and wrote a book instead. Well, points for trying, I suppose. Reach the end of the intro section, take this portal to one of the main land masses, and off we go. Worm Online is a sandbox game, which means no plot, no quests, no direction, just here's a big open world with vast potential, go and build a life. So I will approach this in the same way I approach all new experiences in life. I will cover myself head to toe in leather, and then hope for the best. First of all, where am I? You have a compass to the top right, but you need to stand still for 16 actual seconds for it to stop spinning and actually show you a direction. If you play Worm Online, please be prepared for an extremely slow game. But direction is useless without a map, and thankfully we do have a map, but it doesn't show the player position. It's just a map of the land mass, with the two NPC towns labelled and nothing else. So if you explore Worm Online and get lost, you need to navigate by standing still, waiting for the compass, and then just looking at the local landmarks or trying to map via the stars. As for player skills, you've got loads. Over 100 different tracked stats, from your strength, to your digging, to your forestry, to your cooking, to your skill with a yo-yo, and I'm not making that up. Worm Online is a very deep, stat-focused survival game. You want to see how deep? Cursor over your profile picture to the top left, and you'll see how much health you've got, how much water you've drank, your current calorie intake, and then a breakdown of your macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So while you're surviving in this brutal medieval world, make sure you keep my fitness pal up to date. Worm Online is very much a game where the designer did not stop writing the design document, even though they really should have done, and then just added in everything they came up with. I use this magic portal, choose the newest landmass of Cadence, and then start in the town of Sonata, and off we go. First thing I notice, the background music. It's nice, it's therapeutic, and sometimes, it just stops for seemingly no reason at all. Now usually, in sandbox games, you are thrown into a big open world with no real direction, and this puts players off because that's not novel anymore. That's no longer a new experience, we've had that. But look, in Worm Online, you do have a journal. And in that journal, not quests, but suggested actions. This is brilliant, it's not much, but I'll take it. This small edition is the start of an adventure line, and that gives players like me guidance, a goal. You'll find that players stick around much longer when they are given a reason to, even the loosest sense of direction to follow. First up, cut some trees down. Okay, but not these trees, because they are on player-owned deeds, and that isn't allowed. Worm Online has a consistent world players can claim plots of land on, and then build on and exist in. And remember, this was made back in 2006. That was really impressive back then. Three tries later, the tree falls. Nice animation and sound effects when it does. And the trunk is too large to carry, so you have to cut it up into smaller bits. That's a really nice gameplay touch. Worm Online may be convoluted to the point of excess, but some of its decisions do make logical sense. And as I cut down the trees, I keep being reminded I'm working toward a steam achievement of cutting down trees. So let's see what Steam achievements I've got. Right, there is an achievement for finishing the tutorial, the 20 minute linear section you get guided through. How many people do you think have this? 10%. Over 90% of Steam players quit before finishing the tutorial. 
Now I keep going on and on about the importance of a solid, catchy and fun opening section and this is the perfect example of why. A 90% player loss in the first 20 minutes should not be an acceptable metric. I wonder what some of the rarer achievements are. Kiss someone. Held by less than 1% of players. So if I could do that, I'd be in the top 1% of Worm Online Steam players? Okay, that is my goal. I'm gonna build a house, fight a wolf, and then kiss a stranger. That sounds like a good night out to me. I ask in the global chat, hey, anyone want a kiss? And I get told I'm in the wrong chat. Right, this might be harder than I thought it would be. The global chat is interesting though. They are discussing horse breeding. Thankfully, it's in the game. Worm Online has various animals and you can force them to mate and there's just a bunch of genetic traits they can pass on. You can selectively breed to find the fastest horse or the milkiest cow or the fightiest donkey. The Worm Wiki on animal husbandry is a roller coaster of emotions. When you read, inbreeding will cause the max point value to divide by 1.5 or neither animal should be hungry before mating, you know these designers took this system very, very seriously. Next journal task, flatten a tile. To do this, you must activate your shovel, stand on a tile, right click and choose flatten. But you can't flatten a tile if it's too wonky because your digging skill isn't good enough. And you can't flatten a tile somebody else owns. And you can't flatten a tile with a tree on it or a tile on a road or a tile near a road or a tile that one day might want to become a road. So basically you have to walk into the wilderness until you find an almost already flat tile and then make it actually flat. But sometimes then you'll still get told no because your flatten skill isn't good enough. I try for 15 minutes to flatten any tile. I dig down, I remove grass, I flatten edge by edge and it just will not do it. I even employ the ancient and powerful digging technique of sticking the entire spade straight through my leg and still nothing. Okay, fine. Let's skip the flatten tile bit. What's next? Make a mallet. That's basically it. Create a mallet. I mean, how deep does this go? Do I need to grow a tree? Steal a knife? What are the steps? And this is where the wiki comes in. Now, thankfully, you can right click basically anything and open the wiki page directly from the game. And that's a lovely touch. Now, I still feel that it's a band-aid on the growing problem of complex systems not being covered through emergent gameplay. So you rely on a wiki, but it is a temporary fix for now. If you're a new player, Worm Online is basically a wiki game. You need the wiki open as you play. There is simply no way to get all the information you will need without it. So here are the steps to make a basic mallet. 1. Activate your hatchet. Repeatedly interact with a tree until it's cut down. This might take a few minutes. 2. Chop up the felled trunk into smaller logs. This will also take a few minutes. 3. Pick up the smaller logs. 4. Deactivate your hatchet. Activate your carving knife. 5. Right click on the log in your inventory, then go to create, and out of the 10 possible choices, choose construction material and then shaft. The 100% make chance means this is guaranteed. You'll need a minimum weight of log to carve a shaft out of. If you don't have enough log, just chop more. 6. Make two shafts. 7. Now right click on one of the shafts and go to create, then tool parts, then mallet head. And this has a less than 100% chance, so if you fail, just try again. And 8. Deactivate the carving knife and double click on the mallet head, so that is now your active selected item. Now, right click on the shaft and choose create, then tools, then mallet. And you can fail this process, which means you'll need to just try again. But remember, the shaft you use must weigh more than one kilogram or the mallet head won't attach. If your shaft is too small, just wait until you have bigger wood and try again. Grow up. You'll also notice that the create options when you right click on any raw material change based on the item you have activated, whether that's a saw or a carving knife or a hatchet. Now, please tell me, how is any new player meant to work this out without a wiki? You know, it seems like the perfect thing to put in a tutorial, but no, it's just a figure it out game. The learning curve of Worm Online is just a straight line.
Worm is a game about micromanagement. It's not enough to simply have a hatchet or a knife on you. You must manually activate them. Clicking a tree without activating the hatchet and the game just says, I don't know, what are you trying to do? Nope, not sure what you want there. But when you activate the hatchet and click the tree, it says, oh, you want to chop the tree down, of course, why didn't you say so? It's a game about forcing the player to manage the absolute minutia of every interaction because the developers decided that level of detail gives the game depth. Armed with our new mallet, we now need some iron nails, so this will probably need iron ore. I check the map and nope, it does not show resources. So let's think. Iron is likely found in a mine and that's probably in a cave. So while I look for a resource map online, I find this community created map, which lists all of the player created towns and villages. And it's great to see stuff like this because it captures that feeling that old school forums used to have. Not huge, but connected. And I suppose that's what Worm Online really is. It's a slower paced niche community game where the smaller player base means deeper connections between the people who are actually playing. The main issue with the insular communities that these games tend to promote is they are super convoluted for new players to get into. And sometimes older, more hardcore games actually pride themselves on being hard to understand because the process of understanding is part of the game itself and the prestige of the knowledge of understanding is the reward for playing the game. We could analyse the sociological and psychological implications of a system being complex simply to reward understanding of that system itself, but hey, look, swimming animations. That's how you know this isn't New World. Ah uh, yes, the traditional beach pumpkin. Always a sign of good luck. Once you've picked it up, you can wrap the pumpkin. Oh, thank God, you really did think of everything. The amount of times I've wished I could wrap my pumpkin in MMO games. Find a cave, but this is copper, not iron. So back to running. Oh look, there's a shop. I wonder what they sell. Monthly membership. Well, it seems fair. Premium membership lets you raise your skills above 20, and buying any level of membership will, as it says, prevent your character being deleted after 90 days of inactivity. God damn, Worm Online, are you expecting such a constant and endless surge of players you need to wipe people's accounts after three months of not being gone? The search for iron continues. One of the issues is iron is likely in a cave and caves are probably by mountains, but you are heavily discouraged from leaving the main path because on the path you can run and in the woods you walk slowly. It's ironic because it's an exploration game that feels like it's penalizing you for actually exploring. This donkey is looking at me funny, so this is probably a good time to try out some combat. I right click, choose target and then attack and what on earth is this? What is this button grid combat mini game? Right, so combat has an absolute load of variables. Your focus can be at one of six possible levels. Higher focus in the fight increases your hit and block rate. But you also have a stance check, how far away from the enemy you are based on your weapon's range, and how stable your footing is based on the slope of the land you are fighting on and the direction you are facing. And then this little button, where you can choose which direction you're going to attack from, and then which you're going to try and block incoming attacks from. And there are six fighting sub-skills and loads of armor types and weapon types and shield types. And then three body skills, control, strength and stamina. And after being hit, you will move slower. And there are flanking bonuses for attacking from the side. And if you have the high ground, you actually do have an advantage. This combat system is the perfect example of over-designed and under-involved. There are hundreds of potential variables in even the most basic encounter. You can level up and control almost everything about the fight behind the scenes, and yet as a player, all I see is angry donkey getting slapped around. There may be hundreds of calculations happening right now, but none of them feel like they're affecting me. Sometimes, giving the player fewer options, but having the results of those choices be very obvious, is more enjoyable than many smaller but invisible inputs. After slapping this ass around, again, grow up, I find a magical hidden cave. Look, it just randomly appears as I get closer. Magic? Stealth? I don't know. But there's iron in here, so we're one step closer to nails. There's also a furnace, but how do I start this? Is it plugged in? Is there an on button? 
to the wiki. Right, I need to activate my steel and flint in my inventory and then have some kindling on me. And that means I need to go and chop a tree down and then activate my knife, file the logs into kindling and then activate the flint again and then interact with the furnace and choose light. And once it's on, how do I melt the ore? Do I just use the furnace as a storage box, stick the ore in and wait? Well, the item description of the ore while doing this does seem to be getting hotter, so I guess, yes, we just wait. Wait about five minutes and the ore melts into pure iron, and now I can interact with the anvil which is next to me, which brings up yet another different crafting menu. Could you please have some design consistency in your menu layouts? This menu has two inputs. One of them is the anvil. The other, I assume, should be the iron ball, so I drag that over. And then there's a search menu for known recipes, so I find iron nails and get crafting. There's also a queue up system for planned inputs, and it says you can queue up more actions with higher mind logic. So if you're role playing as Spock, you'll be great at this. Right, I've made a mallet, and now I've made a nail. Next task in my journal plan a house. Right, I can't help but feel we've missed a few steps here in the building order, but okay, let's do this. To plan a house, we need to activate the mallet, find some perfectly flat ground, and right-click plan. And as we already know, my flattening skill is terrible, so I just walk around until I find some already flat land. I try to make a house, and I am not skilled enough. I need higher carpentry. Okay, how do I level carpentry? Wormpedia says make planks. This means activate the hatchet, fell the trees, get the logs, then activate the saw and process the logs into planks. And remember, every action you do in this game takes stamina, the green bar to the top left, and lower stamina means actions will take longer, so you do not want to start an action while you have low stamina, so there is a lot of waiting between stuff happening for your stamina to refill. So while I'm absolutely power leveling carpentry, let's just have a read of some reviews. Worm Online may be slower than Continental Drift, but it has an incredible scope for those players willing to embrace its opportunities. That's from PC Gamer. Imagine you're booting up Minecraft, but it's a private server and everything has been claimed built on by the previous players. This is that. You can walk for an hour in any direction and every inch is already scoured by players. There is no wildlife. There is massively acres of recently sprouted trees. There is only idle NPCs and logged out players. This should not be an open server MMO. I would say go play Worm Unlimited since that's the way you would host your own server, but just read those reviews. You need to get into this right at the start. It was first come, first serve. You aren't first, and you won't be served. Fun MMORPG. Good community, at least on my server. Lots of people willing to help new players. I enjoy the constructing part and skill development, but there is combat. No real quest system. It is truly an open sandbox. Let's be clear. Worm is not for everyone. It's an old MMO with a lot of odd ideas that are completely contrary to modern MMO expectations. That said, there's a definite charm to the game. Once you get past the steep, steep learning curve and the immense grinding necessary to get anything done. This game has corpse runs. If you die, most of your belongings will get left where you were killed, and you have to go back there to retrieve all the stuff. Most newbie equipment is immune from that, but not all newbie equipment. You can get your ass kicked from almost anything in the game at the start, even a fierce feral cat. Yes, kitties can be a life-threatening encounter. I'd call this more of a simulation of living, having a chilled second life in a 2000 era RPG game. It will take hours to get the basic resources for your land. It will take days to build your basic home. It will take weeks to shape your deed. It will take months to shape the land around you. It will take years to master the game. It will take you decades to master the multiple vast lands of Worm. And this review, which might be one of my favourite reviews I've ever read for a game, ever. So, you want to make a bow? Well, get ready, mother, because not only are you going to have to cut down a tree, but then you'll have to turn that tree into a log. From there, it just goes without saying that you'll need to turn that log into some planks and some shafts, so you can make a rope-making tool. But obviously, you'll also need some nails to complete that construction of your rope tool, so find yourself some iron and a way to smelt it, and bang that heated up ore into some nails. With those nails, you can actually finish your rope tool, so you can go and find some hemp plants, grind the hemp into fibre, and use the tools to craft a bow string. Done? Great. Now you can chop down another tree and make a bow. But wait, now you want to use that bow to shoot a fool? A word of warning, if you try to use that bow on someone without first having crafted a quiver and filled it with arrows, which require you to craft shafts to convert 
into arrow shafts, as well as heated iron forge into arrow heads, you will simply throw your bow at the creature instead of firing it, like the ignorant simp peasant you actually are. A plus experience so far would gladly throw my bow at a crocodile again. So it's basically extremely convoluted medieval Minecraft, a super slow, community-focused sandbox MMO made by Notch. There is a definite feeling of love and quality in the systems, but also of intense bloat and excess. So my house. There's a formula on Wormpedia. The carpentry level needed to craft a house is equal to the amount of walls your house will have, plus the amount of floor tiles it will take up. So a one square house needs five carpentry. Let's aim for that. Oh, small issue. You can leave your saw equipped when you try to chop up a log, but you won't saw it. You'll just hack at it like an axe. I've been grinding plank making for about 45 minutes and I'm still not that much closer to level 5, although I am gaining achievements. Slay any creature. 3.8% of people have this. Thanks, donkey. Finishing the planks means I'm carrying a load of weight, so I need to drop them. When you drop multiple items, a small box will appear, and all of the dropped items will get added to it. Now, anyone can loot this box, so sometimes you'll find a nice community supply of logs, or planks, or iron. There's a real community-focused feel in Worm. And that's its main target audience. This is Minecraft for people with a lot of free time and a passion for medieval peasantry. You can create a lot here, you'll just need the patience of a saint. Look at these lovely soaring animations. Majestic, aren't they? You know, sometimes they don't even happen, and you're just twiddling your hands until planks happen. Between the tiles on the floor are the tile edges, and according to the community, fences are a good experience booster, so I just start fencing myself in. Now, you've got to be very careful not to actually fence yourself onto a square, because there's no jump, and the only way to escape is to break the fence. Thankfully, this is indeed much faster than plank making. Okay, so I'm switching tools from hatchet to saw to carving knife, and here's my issue. Nothing happens if you have the wrong tool equipped meaning there's no consequence for failure. With no consequence for failure, the act of swapping doesn't really avoid anything, so it's not really gameplay, it's just busy work. If a player has multiple items they can equip, and interacting with the world while they're equipped changes the outcome of the interaction, then interacting with the wrong item equipped could be used to give an undesirable outcome, to give a reason for the switch to be needed. Consider this, if you play a game, roll a dice and get a 6 to win, but the consequence for rolling any other number is just roll again, there's no real fail state. You'll always win eventually, which means every step up to winning is a time sink. It's not gameplay, because the win state is never ever removed. Swapping from your hatchet to your saw to your knife to go from felling to making a plank to carving a handle is a series of bloated steps in the crafting process. It adds more clicks, but not necessarily more gameplay. Finally, after an age, I hit five carpentry. I find a small plot of land and I stick down the plans for my house. Yes, the frame is up and I've unlocked some more journal steps. Right, let's get some walls up on this bad boy. Oh god, I need 20 planks per wall, which means hours more wood cutting by activating the hatchet and then hours more plank making by activating the saw and finally activating the mallet to add the planks to it. And each plank must be added manually. There's no keep adding until done option. And when you're adding a plank, it'll take between 15 and 30 seconds and God help you if your stamina runs out because then adding a plank takes 60 seconds. Worm Online is a tedious, time consuming game. It's undeniably deep, but good lord, it is a time sink. If you have got less than three or four hours a day to play for several months at a time while also reading the wiki in your free time or a massive group of friends to play with, just don't bother. You'll make no visible progress. If you want a perfect example of how over-designed this game is with superfluous detail, how hyper-focused Worm Online is on the absolute minutia of design to the point of bloat, look at the top left there is a speedometer. Accurate to two decimal places. Who needs that? No one has ever been playing an MMO and thought, this game would be much better if I knew my exact speed at all times. 30 minutes after the house frame went up, I finally get one wall fully planked. I now just need some more nails, and I've completely forgotten where the awesome hidden mine was, so I just wander around until I find another. 
and I bump into this trader in the starting city. But I have no silver, so I can't afford anything. God, look at all these colours and textures and lighting and assets and various sizes. It's hard to believe this is one of the major landmarks in MMO sandbox history. It looks like a random collection of assets placed haphazardly together. It's the harsh edges and the jarring texture and colour palette clashes which make it look so garish. Each one of these things relates to one of the game's hundred skills or character attributes. No one told Worm Online's developers to stop adding things or to make things look nicer. And this was the result. Oh right, it seems there is a giant public mine in the main city. I guess that's the iron taken care of. I just need some tinder to light the fire and all these local trees are owned so I take a quick swim over to a local wood and once again start chopping down trees. I swear, sandbox MMOs are basically full of lumber Lumberjacks, because chopping trees seems to be the first and then most frequent thing any player does. While chopping, I get a DM from the player Mode, who asks if I am the real Josh. So I have a short existential crisis, wondering if I am the only real Josh, and then we chat about the game. They are a returning player, and they can now understand how overwhelming the new experience actually is. So we chat and both agree it's a really deep game with a lot of complex, extremely poorly explained systems, which is a shame, because with the right tutorial or adventure line, this would be a great experience. So let's discuss the advantage of an adventure line, even in a sandbox. The adventure line is a general guiding concept in storytelling or gaming. It's the invisible line the player is encouraged to follow by multiple game design factors. It may be narrative encouragement, such as an NPC saying, hey, go down that path. It could be a visual cue, such as a single flicker of light at the end of a dark cave encouraging you to walk toward it. It could be an audio cue, a noise getting louder as you get closer. Or it could be avoiding a negative cue, you are being chased by an enemy, go and hide. It could even be a limitation of other choices, which is a lazy but viable way to railroad the player. Essentially, the adventure line is the journey you want the player to take. The satirical metagame The Stanley Parable even has the rare adventure line start mode where you follow a literal yellow line until it finally starts curving up the wall and running away from you, leaving you stranded, parodying the idea of relying on it too heavily. The problem with the sandbox MMOs isn't that they're open and free, that's a strength of the genre. It's the lack of an optional, and that's the key word, optional adventure line. If your open world has an optional adventure line, players who like structure will follow it, and players who dislike structure will ignore it but both demographics will benefit from it being there. Notice how I've been following the journal, doing what it's suggested. That's a basic adventure line, a series of goals to achieve. Even Minecraft, one of the most freeform games ever, has an adventure line, kill the ender dragon. That framework, no matter how subtle, is essential for hundreds of thousands of players to latch onto. It's a crutch they can lean on until they feel confident enough to explore by themselves. Worm Online is actually a really impressive bunch of systems, which is brutally difficult to get into, and this is a shame, because if there were a more involved adventure line to bring players in and support them, until they feel the desire to leave and explore by themselves, using the skills they've gained, I can see it appealing to a lot more players. And you'd probably have a much higher percentage than 10 who finish your tutorial. A big, brutal fantasy world to exist in was a novelty back in the early 2000s, but now we've got choices. Mortal Online 1 and 2, Darkfall, Life is Feudal, Worm Online, Albion Online, Second Life, eventually Ashes of Creation. Players who say they want a sandbox MMO actually have a lot of choice, but sandboxes often struggle to get or keep players. Why? There are tens of thousands of players saying they want a game just like Worm Online, so why aren't they playing? It's not because they lack systems or content, it's often because the in-game framework to help new players understand or access that content is non-existent. Sandbox games spend so much development time cramming stuff in, they forget to put the time or the passion into helping players appreciate what they have crammed in. I finally get a load more logs, but I'm also thirsty, so I'll take a big old gulp of seawater. There's also the small issue of, I can't remember where my house is, but I'm sure I'll find that if I wander around long enough. After chatting to Mode a bit more via PM, I think, you know what, let's shoot my shot. Let's go and be a top 1% achiever. What if we kissed by the town fountain? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Unless. Uh, but no, I joke. But. So I say, hey, let's kiss. And they're up for this. And they reply, I'm a woman clad in leather 
and I know my way around a shaft because they have a 100% craft rate. Which I think is one of the only Worm Online related pickup lines in the world. Truly I have found a master of the game. So we meet up by the fountain in the main square. It takes me a while to figure out the emote system and I come dangerously close to attacking her but finally we kiss and boom! Top 1% achievement on Steam! I am now an authority on Worm Online. Back to building my house. I mean, I'd invite Mode back with me to my lakefront property, but the house has no walls or roof or door, so not exactly a bachelor pad just yet. It's strange, because Worm Online is what so many people keep telling me they want. I get messages every day from people saying, Hey Josh, I'm looking for a deep, involved, brutal online world I can forge out a meagre existence in that lets me do whatever I want. Okay, here you go. It's here. It's been here since 2006. It's slow, it's deep, it's involved. Honestly, Worm Online is less of a game and more of an online community planning project. Everyone's working together. Everyone digs a mine, everyone builds a castle, then tribes form and warfare begins. I don't want to gentrify this game with a storyline or dungeons or theme park aspects, despite the fact that I am a theme park fan. I want to leave Worm as it is, but add a basic supporting framework to encourage new players. To guide them until they are ready to face the world alone. Worm Online is actually really good. It's just so bloody hard to get into, it's losing 90% of its players in the first opening hour. Exploring is slow, gathering is repetitive, and building is both. But there is a charm to it. And finally, after seven hours, I have a house! It still doesn't have a roof, but I don't care! My pad is complete! Only 1.8% of Steam players made it this far. I feel accomplished. So what's next? I have a look through the skills list. I could always train my yo-yo skill. I'm not even making that up, there is a yo-yo skill. But look in the journal. Ride a cow. Right. This is happening. The wiki tells me I need to activate a rope, which thankfully I've got, find a cow, right-click and lead it for a while, then right-click, jump on it and ride. So I scour the grasslands and I can't find a cow, but I can find an aging donkey, which is kind of like a sad cow. So I lead the donkey, and then I try to ride it, and what the hell is this? What is... Who did the animations? You've had since 2006 to change this. How? Why are my arms doing that? Was yesterday shoulders day in the gym? Have I just set in this position? You know what, if anyone asks, tell them this is Elden Ring on really low graphics. Explore for a while, still can't find a cow, but I can find a unicorn. Can't kill it though, because it's on someone's land. And why has the music changed to ambient sigh chill? Yeah, let's just zone out while we ride the aging donkey through the slow forest. Ride the donkey across the beach and right, here's a problem. I know this looks climbable, but remember, there's no jump. So this fence, no matter how close to the ground it looks, is actually impossible to pass over. So around the edge we go. Here's a nice touch. If there's a guard nearby, you can call on them to help you kill wolves. And then you can always just attack the guards after, which is a bad idea because they're dangerous. But I want to see what'll happen when you die. It seems you respawn in the traditional way. Crotch first inside a sundial. I mean, we've all been here, haven't we? Hey, finally a tavern. Let's get drunk. But there is no beer. Fantastic. There is a ladder, so we can see how levels work. They work with a very clunky climbing animation, and then you can just stand in mid-air and not fall down. Brilliant. Oh look, a massive statue of some ancient avatar thing. Can we climb the statue? No, you can't. Because it doesn't have any collision at all. Worm Online, the ultimate sandbox MMO. Deep, involved, complex, absolutely but also frustratingly convoluted to get into. No jumping, and no collision on giant statues. And the riding animation looks like, well, this. 
Worm Online is deep. There's a lot to love, but my god, it is showing its age. It is so rough around the edges, and it is so bloody difficult to get into. And when you try and quit, it does that annoying cutesy thing of having a silly quit message, saying, Quit now? Are you crazy? You know what, Worm Online? Let's make a deal. If you don't want me to quit, then how about you put a little more effort into helping me want to stay? I want other people to play and enjoy Worm Online, but I also want Worm Online to put a little bit more time and design effort into helping those new players actually see what's involved. So to end the review, I would love to give Worm Online a score out of 10, but I've still got my keyboard activated and I need to activate my mouse, so just let me switch and then right click the game and select score and then reward and then reward score. Oh, hang on now, I need to use the keyboard to rename the game first to Worm Finished, so let me switch back and oh, I've got the mic activated by accident. Hang on, let me first, okay, you've got to create, then review and then score, I think, hang on, let me just open the wiki. Oh right, you need to have written at least 10 pages before you can review the game, or before the review can be combined with the score, so let me just fell another tree for some more logs, and then equip the whittling knife, and then printing press, and press the mush into some paper, and then oh, I've got to switch to the hatchet, and then craft knife, now I've got the paper, let me switch to my pen, and then write more, right click on the paper, create review of game, and oh hang on, this is a new process, my pen's empty, so I need to make some ink, let me just check the wiki on how you make ink, 